a land steeped in history and folklore, harbors a multitude of ancient structures and spectral sites. These remnants serve as a poignant reminder of the Ireland's rich heritage and dark past. Nestled along the scenic coastline of County Cork, the charming seaside resort of Kinsale exudes an innocence that belies its darker reputation. Renowned as one of Ireland's most haunted towns, Kinsale is a magnet for stories of ethereal inhabitants that defy the boundaries of the mortal realm. Among the countless spectral tales, one haunting narrative stands out, the legend of the White Lady. Today we look at the haunts of Kinsale and a tale of ill-fated love that caused a new bride to fall to her death and haunt a historical military fortress for eternity. So if you're curious, let's take a walk through history. It seems most countries have a tale of a lady in white who haunts historic areas where locals fear to tread. Kinsale, perhaps, has the most famous tale, and certainly one that is steeped in historical significance. Located just outside of Kinsale, Charles Fort, built between 1677 and 1682 during the reign of Charles II, is one of the finest surviving examples of a 17th century star-shaped fortress. One of the earliest governors of Charles Fort was Colonel Warrender, a strict disciplinarian and unbending upholder of the military code. His only daughter, Willful, now found herself living in a fort surrounded by dashing young officers, and it wasn't long before she set her sights upon a candidate for love and marriage. Despite her father's initial disapproval, Willful chose one of the garrison's rising stars, Sir Trevor Ashurst a man who immediately spotted the advantages of marrying the governor's daughter. On their wedding night, the young couple decided to take a stroll upon the fort's battlements, their first private moment as husband and wife. Spotting a thicket of wildflowers growing at the fort's lowest foundations, an excited Willful pleaded with her new husband to pick them as the first bouquet of their married life. Dispatching his bride to their quarters, Sir Trevor then summoned one of the sentries and ordered him to clamber down the steep walls to pick the flowers. To dispel the sentry's fears over leaving his post unattended, Sir Trevor swapped uniforms with the enlisted man, reassuring him he would maintain his watch during his absence. But it had been a long day for Sir Trevor, but with the wedding and the many celebratory drinks, and he quickly dozed off, dressed in the sentry's uniform. As bad fortune would have it, Colonel Warrender chose that exact moment to conduct one of his frequent unannounced inspections of the battlements, only to come upon a sentry asleep at his post. Challenging the dormant figure and receiving no reply, the colonel immediately drew his pistol and shot the sentry dead, the standard penalty for dereliction of duty under his imperious command. Not yet realizing what he had done, the colonel ordered the body taken down to the center of the parade ground, a public lesson to the entire garrison on the importance of duty. At that exact moment, Willful, impatient for her flowers, arrived in search of her errant husband, only to discover his dead body upon a slab. It was a moment of ghastly realization for father and daughter, a moment that would change their lives forever. Willful, insane with grief, ran screaming along the fort's battlements toward the Charles Bastion, the highest point over the harbor waters. Looking out to the sea and then back to her father, she shouted, Trevor, my love, I'm coming to you, and threw herself, still clad in her white wedding dress, to certain death on the jagged rocks below. What had been intended as the wedding feast would now transform into a funeral supper as the news of this incredible tragedy spread across Kinsale. Later that evening, the colonel, now completely deranged with grief over the day's events, took his pistol, the same gun with which he had earlier killed his son-in-law, and shot himself. It's no wonder it's been passed into Kinsale's history as the story of a wedding and three funerals. Today, in the peaceful town of Kinsale, a spectral presence emerges along the ramparts where her life was tragically cut short. 
the ethereal figure known as the White Lady of Kinsale continues to wander clad in her wedding gown, serving as a poignant reminder of the simultaneous joy and sorrow that unfolded on that fateful day. Up until 1921, soldiers and their families used to live there, and numerous accounts, spanning generations, bear witness to her apparition. In one story, a nurse saw the lady in white appear out of nowhere, in one corner of the room. Startled, she watched as the lady crossed to the bedside of an officer's young son, who was sound asleep. The lady stood watching the boy for a few moments, then reached out and caught his wrist in her hand. The boy woke, shrieking, Take your cold hands off my wrist! Whereupon the lady simply vanished. In another, the lady was seen looking over a banister by the daughter of an officer. The small daughter of a Major Black, who served at Charles Fort in the early 19th century, was watching two orderlies pack her father's gear for a short trip. When out of the blue, the child asked, Who's that lady watching us over the banister? The two soldiers looked up, but saw no one. The little girl insisted, though, that she had seen a pretty lady, dressed all in white, smiling at her from the staircase. The lady in white usually walks into officers' quarters, making no sound at all, as she ascends the stairs to the area where her room had been on that dreadful night. Usually, once she's spotted, she simply vanishes into thin air. Those who have seen her say that her clothing is very old-fashioned and white, like a bridal gown. In the autumn of 1921, it was reported that the fort's medical officer was found unconscious at the foot of the staircase where the lady in white had been seen many times before. When he came to, he said, as he bent over to get the key to his rooms out from underneath the doormat, he was grabbed around the torso and dragged across the hall and thrown down the staircase. As he was falling, he caught a glimpse of a young woman in an old-fashioned wedding dress. Scarcely a year later, a Captain Javes was going up to his quarters when he heard odd rattling noises from behind his locked door. At the same time, he caught a glimpse of a woman in a white gown rushing down the hall, away from him. When he tried to get into his quarters, he found the door was locked from the inside, although he had not left it so. Captain Javes set his shoulder to the door and pushed with all his strength. Just then, a blast of cold wind blew past him and he was picked up by some unseen force and thrown headlong down the stairway. He lay unconscious for some time before being found by a fellow officer. Beyond the confines of the fort, the white lady roams the familiar streets of her native town. Even today, sightings of her ghostly form walking through the streets of Kinsale persist. One local claims he went for a run near Charles Fort one night, and at one point, he stopped to retie his shoe. He put his hand on the fort wall for balance and felt another hand reach out from the wall to help him. There's a hotel called the White Lady, and Willful's ghost appears there every few weeks. One proprietor of the hotel claims to have seen Willful on New Year's Eve in the kitchen, making toast. But the White Lady is not always a gentle spirit, and there are some who insist that it's not a spirit at all but instead more of a demonic presence. The following is an extract from a statement made by Michael O'Donoghue of the British Military Hospital that details the paranormal phenomenon he witnessed in Kinsale Military Barracks 100 years ago. While I was quartered in Kinsale Barracks, I witnessed and experienced some extraordinary and eerie incidents. Bill O'Connor, Mick Crowley, Sean Lehane, Jack Fitz, and I slept in the officers' quarters. Occasionally at night, we'd stayed and played bridge. One large room was fitted with three beds for the convenience of IRA officers coming along casually. This night, I had gone to bed alone in this room. I awoke suddenly about 2 a.m. with a feeling of some great danger threatening me. I sat up calling, who's there? Not a sound. Then I felt an oppressive weight crushing down on my two legs. I felt paralyzed. Now, quite awake, I thrust out my hands to push aside what was crushing me. I thought it was one of the lads coming in late sitting on me for a practical joke. Snarling at the same time, get off my feet, you bastard. But there was nobody there. Cold sweat broke out all over me. 
Then suddenly I felt the awful weight removed from my feet. I heard what I thought was a mocking devilish laugh and then the door slammed. I jumped out of bed, rushed to the door and pulled it open. Not a sign of life or movement. Shaking now, I locked the door, went back to sit bolt upright in my bed, smoking a cigarette to steady my nerves. Hours passed and nothing happened. In the morning, I questioned the others. They had noticed nothing. A few nights later, shots rang out in the barracks square. Around midnight, the sentry on duty had ordered a shadowy figure approaching him across the square to halt. The figure kept advancing and the sentry fired. The guard turned out and made a thorough search without finding anything. Then in the guard room, peculiar things happened nightly. The guards became scared at rattly noises. Weird blood-curdling shrieks, curses, yells, and other terrifying phenomenon kept the lads who stayed and slept in the place in a constant state of nervous tension and fear. The position became so bad that a priest was called in as the IRA guard parties were refusing to stay there. A Franciscan father came. He knelt for a time on the stone floor in the guard room, then arose, saying that his knees felt scorched from the burning heat of the floor. Moving closer to the walls, he prayed again. He stood up again, and the beads of perspiration were large and visible on his forehead. There is something terribly bad, some awful evil in those walls, he said. We were all wide-eyed. Moving around the guard room walls, the Franciscan prayed fiercely in the dead silence. Suddenly, he turned around to the officer of the guard. Tear down those walls, he ordered. The covering on the walls was torn off, a mixture of paint, plaster, and paper. The timber wainscoting was smashed off. There on the exposed surface of the wall were some frightful pictures, some painted, some pasted. They were horrible, diabolical, obscene. The priest ordered them to be destroyed, as they were by burning them off the wall surface. It was done. The father then prayed once more and assured us as he left that no more would the peace of the guard room be troubled, that the evil spirits that molested the guards had been exorcised. And so it was. From then on, no more was heard from the mysterious ghostly prowlings in the military barracks of Kinsale. Once a bastion of military might, Charles Fort ceased its military operations in 1922. Today, it stands as a revered national monument of Ireland, protected by the Irish Office of Public Works. Those who venture to this magnificent site might find themselves in the presence of history's specter, catching a fleeting glimpse of the mysterious figure forever known as the White Lady. But these sightings beg the question, who or what is the White Lady of Kinsale? Thanks for watching, folks. I'll see you next time as we explore more curious history. Take care.